My name is Dr. Alan Taylor and I'm the Chief of Cardiology at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. My interests here include the general care of all heart patients, uh, cardiovascular prevention and imaging, new ways to image heart disease, and then the treatment of advanced heart disease, heart failure, cardio-oncology. So diverse interests related to heart disease. I was in the Army for 20 years, during which time I was a Chief of Cardiology at Walter Reed and did research with the University at the Uniformed Services uh, University in Bethesda. And then after retiring in 2008, joined MedStar. And it's been a great several years working in the Research Institute at MedStar and now here at Georgetown. Cardiology is the best field in medicine because we have great ways to diagnose patients' problems and treat their problems to help them live longer, fuller lives. And at Georgetown, the best thing is the environment of care we provide. Within the Jesuit tradition of compassionate healing of the whole person, and patients really appreciate the opportunity to be helped. And a patient who leaves the hospital or leaves your care feeling better, uh, that you've made really good decisions in, that are based in the best evidence with treatments you know are gonna help them. And you've done that in this friendly, caring organization, in a teaching organization, one where while delivering that care, we're also teaching the next generation of physicians. And we really have pretty much everything a patient would need, a full range of services for everything from prevention through treatment of advanced heart disease uh, within a network within the MedStar system where we have even complex levels of care all the way to heart transplantation. So when they come to MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, they've got everything they could possibly ever need for their heart care available to them. MedStar Georgetown University Hospital is a special place. It starts with its history. Uh, a lot of the cardiovascular interventions we use today were pioneered or tried here first. And there's a great history here of excellent clinical diagnostic cardiovascular care. Physicians with great acumen to diagnose and treat your problem. And that's really where it starts in the patient-physician relationship, which I think is very special here. Once here, we work within an institute across the region where we've got every possible treatment available, from the best preventive and screening tools to the best in treatment approaches for acute heart problems like heart attacks, to chronic heart problems like heart failure with artificial hearts and heart transplants, to the best heart, heart arrhythmia specialists, and now even to surgeons that work closely with our cardiologists to do, for example, valve insertion without surgery. So there's a broad range of treatments we have from prevention to even the treating the most advanced heart disease available to us with a compassionate, caring environment. Heart disease is a problem that's not caused by any one factor. Many risk factors from high blood pressure to cholesterol problems, diabetes, overweight, inactivity. So many things, so many risk factors that we can actually treat to reduce risk for heart disease. There are also things we can't treat, things like genetics, inheritance, and uh, gender. And so there's, while there's things we can't treat, there's so many things that we can treat that are risk factors and they're easily measurable. You can measure your blood pressure and you should know your blood pressure. You can measure your cholesterol. You should know your cholesterol numbers. You should know whether you do or don't have diabetes. And if you're smoking or overweight or inactive, those are things that you should correct. And so there's many risk factors for heart disease and so many are treatable. Heart disease develops over decades from the risk factors patients have to the ultimate manifestation with symptoms or problems of the heart and the blood vessels. Between that period of time, there's a long silent phase when artery problems will develop, atherosclerosis or buildups will occur, and those eventually can lead to things like chest pains when the arteries are clogged, or heart attacks when the arteries become suddenly clogged, leading to damage of the heart muscle. And with enough heart damage, or with enough stress and strain of something such as hypertension or high blood pressure, heart failure or the weakening of the heart muscle can occur, leading to problems with breathing. So there's a whole range of symptoms which can occur as signs of heart disease affecting the heart, the blood vessels that have developed over decades from risk factors. So it all comes back to risk factors, treating those early in life, and then watching for those symptoms that are a sign that the heart and blood vessel have been affected.
A heart attack is when the blood flow to the heart muscle through the arteries that bring oxygen to the muscle becomes suddenly blocked and the muscle becomes damaged. It dies or a portion of it dies because of lack of oxygen. That can be manifest by chest pains or breathing troubles and it can be determined by or diagnosed by looking at the electrocardiogram or measuring blood tests for signs of that heart damage. So a heart attack is a sudden change in blood flow to the heart muscle leading to heart muscle damage. Heart cardiac arrest is when the heart beating suddenly stops, leading to collapse, loss of consciousness, and is a true medical emergency. Within four minutes, there's irreversible brain damage. And that's where community-based CPR, rapid activation of 911, and defibrillators in the community have been so life-saving. Exercise is the wonder drug. Exercise reduces blood pressure, cholesterol, body weight, blood sugar, does all these great things to risk factors which in the end wind up to a markedly lower risk for future heart disease. Even if you've had heart disease, patients who exercise are at much lower risk for subsequent or later on heart problems. In fact, we want them to exercise. They should exercise and it's safe to exercise. Of course, after a heart event, we often monitor people in rehabilitation programs for a brief period of time to make sure it's safe to exercise. But ultimately, the goal of cardiology is to prevent heart disease, and when it occurs, get people back to full functioning, and that includes exercise. Diet is so important. Diet includes the fats you eat, the amount of salt you eat, uh, and the types of foods you eat, whether they're processed or natural. Uh, diets that are high in processed foods or high in sodium raise blood pressure. Diets that are high in fat raise cholesterol. So a healthy diet is a balanced diet, not one that restricts all fats, not one that uh, avoids everything, but includes modest amounts of fruits and vegetables, limits saturated fats and meats, limits fried foods, and in, tries to avoid salt through processed foods. Diet is incredibly important as a way to prevent heart disease. One of the things we do the best is measure cholesterol and determine who needs treatment. Very clear guidelines tell us when a patient needs drugs and what drugs are effective and what our targets are. And this has all been established through very careful science. So you should know your cholesterol numbers. You should know your bad cholesterol, your LDL and optimal should be below 100 for all people, certainly below 130. And the more risk factors for heart disease you have, the lower it should be. You should know your good cholesterol, your HDL number. It should be over 40 if you're a man and 50 if you're a woman. And exercise, modest alcohol consumption, and drugs will help increase that if it's low. So blood cholesterol is a very important risk factor for heart disease. High levels of bad cholesterol, low levels of good cholesterol, increase your risk for heart disease. Both are very measurable and very treatable. Heart attacks occur because buildups have occurred and developed in the arteries over decades. It starts in teenage and young adult years through high blood pressure, cholesterol, poor diets, inactivity. Those buildups accumulate until ultimately they cause a sudden drop in blood flow to the heart muscle. It's that period of time between having risk factors through buildups to heart attack that we can act to prevent heart attacks by measuring risk factors to predict future risk for heart disease. The more risk factors you have, the more at risk you are. And in many cases, to actually measure the arteries and assess if they are or are not developing buildups faster than they should for age. So we can measure buildups, we can predict future heart risk, and we can treat future heart risk. Diabetes is an important risk factor for heart disease, as is the precursor to diabetes, a syndrome known as metabolic syndrome when blood sugar can be a little abnormal and other risk factors are, occur are occurring with high blood sugar. So we know that high blood levels of blood sugar, whether diabetes or metabolic syndrome, are important heart disease risk factors. For example, a patient with diabetes has the risk of a heart attack as if, someone, as if they'd already had a heart attack. 
It's called a risk equivalent. Diabetes is a diagnosis which carries the same risk of someone who's already had a known heart attack. So it's a very important risk factor. So we treat patients with diabetes very aggressively as if they've already had a heart attack, even if they haven't, to achieve low levels of cholesterol, lower levels of blood pressure, to use aspirin to prevent clotting, uh, making sure they're exercising and on a good diet. Through this approach, we can reduce the risk of heart disease for diabetics. Diabetes is not a death sentence from heart disease, but it's an important risk factor. And if we identify diabetes, treat the diabetes and the other risks associated with it, we can actually improve patients' outcomes. Patients with diabetes have not just the diabetes, which leads to the promotion of artery buildups, but diabetes occurs within a common clustering of other risk factors high blood pressure, abnormal levels of blood cholesterol. And so it's not just the diabetes per se, which leads to the heart disease, but it's the other risk factors in association. And it's like gas on a fire. If the fire is the diabetes, the other risk factors are the gas, and the two are worse from the standpoint of develop developing heart disease. So it's not just a one problem that diabetics have, it's treating the diabetes and everything else that comes with it, including being commonly overweight, which can often be, lead to physical inactivity. So very important for diabetics to get control of their body weight, to be active, and to know all their risk factors to optimally treat their risk for heart disease. Family history is an extremely important part of knowing your heart risk. Risk factors explain perhaps one-third of the risk for heart disease. The other two-thirds comes from factors we can't measure, and a lot of that can be judged through family history. So what's an abnormal family history? Well, strictly speaking, it's when, the, when a man, a first-degree relative, your father or a brother, has a heart attack prior to the age of 55, or a woman, mother, sister, before the age of 65. But you may have had an uncle that had a heart attack at age 70. Is that a family history? Well, it is, but it's a weaker one. What if all the uncles in, on your father's side had heart attacks? To me, that's a little stronger signal of a family, family history of heart problems. So it's not a clear definition of a family history, but it's the aggregate of looking at everybody in your genetic that has, shares genes with you and leads to that assessment of what your family risk is. It's, a, in a sense, a poor man's genetic, genetic test. What are the genes that lead to heart disease? Well, they haven't really been identified yet. Family history is the clue. And patients with family history with the same risk factors versus those who don't have a family history are two to three times more likely to develop heart disease in the future. Really, in this day and age, nobody should be smoking because it's a very clear risk, fa risk factor for heart disease. When you stop smoking, as hard as it can be, your risk for a heart attack goes down immediately and within two to five years becomes that of a non-smoker, which is really pretty fascinating. And it relates to the fact that smoking does damages the artery walls, creates the potential for clotting, and it increases the risk for a heart attack. Importantly, even secondhand smoke increases the risk for heart attack. Countries that have banned smoking in public places have seen 20% reductions in the population incidence of heart, heart attack from simple secondhand, secondhand smoke exposure. That old sitting on the airplane breathing in secondhand smoke, sitting in a restaurant breathing in secondhand smoke, that was dangerous for you. So kudos to public health uh, people for getting rid of secondhand smoke in the community because even that's dangerous. So if you're a smoker, you're not just damaging your own health and increasing your risk for heart attack, but that of the people around you. Anyone who smokes today should stop smoking. Heart attack symptoms are important to identify because early treatment leads to better outcomes. Symptoms of a heart attack include chest pain and shortness of breath. Now the classic chest pain for a heart attack is a central or left-sided chest pain, a pressure, a weight sensation that can radiate up into the neck or the shoulders, the left arm, and it's associated with sweating or nausea. That's the classical presentation. The thing we learn about heart disease and heart attack is that not everyone presents in the same way. 
which is why we cast a broad net to catch a few fish. That is, we say, be attentive to chest symptoms. Patients feel their own personal sensation of heart disease differently. Older women, particularly, and women often feel heart attacks and chest pain, heart pain in different ways. Back pain, fatigue can be symptoms of heart disease, particularly in older women. The symptoms of heart attack are not always different in men and women. The classical symptoms of heart attack, the central pr chest pressure, the radiation to the neck, breathing, nausea, sweatiness, can occur in men and women. It's just that women, sometimes more commonly than men, will present in atypical or not classical ways. They might feel fatigued, have pain in their back, uh, have pain that comes and goes, isn't that classical pressure sensation. When a heart attack begins, which is when an artery becomes blocked by a clot up over a plaque, heart muscle damage starts within about 20 minutes or becomes irreversible in about 20 minutes and it progresses. Out to about six hours, it's complete. But there's a window of time when a heart attack can be stopped through clot busting medications or direct approaches to reestablish blood flow down the artery. So time is of the essence. The earlier the presentation, the earlier treatment starts. The earlier treatment starts, and treatment is designed to reopen arteries. So we have a few delays we could try to get rid of to improve outcomes in heart attack. One is the time that patients take to recognize their symptoms and present. The second is once patients get to care, how quickly we act. For example, in our center, we have a goal of 90 minutes. From the time someone hits the door, their artery should be open within 90 minutes. Those are the national standards, and we achieve that. But the biggest delay we can face is the delay of patients recognizing their symptoms. Chest pain, breathing troubles, unusual presentations, get to care early, because early care means a better chance of surviving. We know it reduces the risk for heart attack by about a quarter. And if you're having a heart attack, it reduces the risk of having a fatal heart attack by about the same amount. So aspirin, as simple as it is, is a very important drug for us. That said, aspirin has its risks. It increases the risk for bleeding in the stomach and in the brain, for example. So we have to use aspirin in the right patients. But if you're home and you're having chest pain, is an aspirin a solution for you? Well, maybe, maybe not. Taking an aspirin probably isn't harmful in that setting but delaying care to take an aspirin would be. So you've seen the commercials. I'm having chest pain, I took an aspirin. Is that a solution? It's not a solution. The best solution is to call 911, get to care, and get under treatment. Ultimately, when there's a buildup in the artery, what happens is there's a turbulent blood flow, abnormal blood flow, or a rupture of a plaque, and a clot occurs. And that's why aspirin as a preventive medicine can be so effective for heart disease. It prevents the clotting, but it doesn't prevent the buildups. And so the fundamental problem is risk factors that lead to buildups. And while we prevent heart attack in part by using aspirin to prevent clotting, we really need to treat the root cause, which is preventing buildups by treating risk factors. Heart disease is still the number one killer of men and women in this country and is gaining as a cause of morbidity and mortality, death and problems around the world. We can prevent heart disease. And the nice thing about cardiology these days is we've got new treatments to prevent and new treatments to treat once problems do occur. The future is that we can take care, take care of patients who have established heart disease from preventing more heart attacks treating heart failure, artificial hearts, heart transplantation, and treating every possible heart rhythm problem that a heart can develop these days with catheters and surgery. So we've got every possible treatment available for patients who already have heart disease. But also on the front end, in prevention, we've got treatments that we know work, that if we can just apply more fully, will prevent patients from having heart attacks and that lead to 
heart failure and death. So it's that treatment of risk factors, good control of blood pressure, good control of cholesterol, eliminating smoking, treating diabetes are so important, while we also encourage patients to eat well, lose weight, and exercise. New technologies are coming up all the time in cardiology, which is one of the things that makes it so exciting. On the prevention side, new imaging techniques to image the arteries in the neck or image the arteries in the heart to see if buildups are occurring long before they develop pro uh, symptoms. It's an exciting way to help our predictive capabilities and get the right patient the right treatment at the right time. Once patients do develop heart disease, all sorts of new treatments, new stents that, that secrete drugs to prevent uh, block up buildups from occurring again. Once heart muscle damage occurs, gene and stem cell therapies to regenerate heart muscle are in development. If heart failure gets really advanced, artificial hearts that can prolong your life to the point you can get a heart transplant. And all sorts of new devices to prevent fatal heart rhythm problems from implantable defibrillators that are now moving to ones that don't even have to, defibrillators don't even have to go through your veins. So there's all sorts of technical developments from prevention to treatment to the treatment of a very advanced heart disease and ultimately prevention of death. Uh, some of the latest, most exciting things are heart, artificial heart valves, new heart valves that could be inserted without surgery. So it's a pretty exciting time where treatments are getting better and less invasive while we're also at the same time preventing more heart disease. Heart failure is the most common discharge diagnosis for patients admitted to the hospital, costing billions and billions of dollars a year. Heart failure arises because there's been heart disease that's developed across decades, and now the heart is failing, unable to pump enough blood to support the body. And that's the problem known as heart failure. It's a, tr it's a problem treated with medications and treated well with medications if the right medications. But what's new and exciting there are advanced treatment op options to mechanically support the failing heart through insertion of artificial hearts that now have become very commonplace. Uh, for example, Vice President Cheney recently had had an artificial heart and then survived to get a heart transplant. Very commonplace these days. Uh, and so heart failure is an exciting area because it's such a common problem. Uh, while we're trying to prevent heart failure by preventing heart disease in general, once it occurs, we've now got everything from drugs to devices to surgery to help the problem. So you've come to the doctor, you've been given a diagnosis, and you receive a prescription. Then what? Well, the best drug not taken is completely useless. And what we've learned is that if we don't take the medicines that are provided that we know work, we actually fall short of our goals of trying to prevent heart disease. So this is a chain of responsibility to get the right treatment identified, to get the right treatment provided, but then for the patient to adhere to that treatment program. And we know that non-adherence, for example, if you stop your cholesterol pills, your risk is far higher of a heart attack than if you don't. If you don't take your blood pressure pills and your blood pressure is higher, you have a higher risk of a stroke or heart attack than if you don't. So while there's this great search for new medicines that are going to solve heart disease, you know, we've got a lot of the answers now. And if we can get the right patient, the right treatment at the right time, we're going to do a really good job of, at preventing future heart disease. You know, the great problem is that a lot of these risk factors are silent. You don't feel your cholesterol. You don't feel your blood pressure. But they take their toll over time through adverse effects on the blood vessels in the heart. And so there is this long period of time we have to act. And only if we act can we prevent heart attacks, heart failure, sudden death, stroke, the things that we're trying to prevent down, down the line. And these risk factors develop early in life. At age 30 to 40, you should know your risk factor profile because your lifetime risk of heart disease as a 40-year-old man is still about 50%. And so knowing your risk factors early in life gives you a long time to prevent heart disease in the future. And it's lifestyle first. It's a good diet, it's exercise, it's avoiding tobacco, maintaining a good body weight. Those go a long way towards optimizing heart health. But when that doesn't work for a problem, your blood pressure is too high, your cholesterol is out of control, 
we have great drug treatments that work, but they only work when you take them. And it's important to be educated about the symptoms that could be developed. If you're at risk for heart disease, know the possible symptoms, chest pain, breathing troubles, and not everyone reads a textbook. Not everyone develops the classic symptoms. So if you're concerned, seek attention. We have great diagnostic tests to identify heart disease, and when identified, great treatments to get you back going again. A lot of heart disease is now arising as a secondary condition of other problems, like sleep apnea and cancer treatment. And so what's new is there's increased collaboration between specialists, not working in your silo, but working in collaboration, and people specializing in this. People specializing, for example, in cardio-oncology, cardiologists who know the, the cardiac consequences of oncologic treatment, drugs and radiation. Look for those and treat those when they occur. It's an unfortunate thing. A patient with a cancer gets a drug that they need to treat their cancer and develop heart disease. But by working together to identify these patients, study the new drugs, uh, to do clinical trials and studies, know which drugs have, a higher consequences, uh, have higher consequences for heart disease, and then treating them when, when they occur you know, it's a, is important. So it's a new field in cardiology, cardio-oncology, as well as other shared disciplines like pulmonary or sleep medicine and cardiology. Uh, people with sleep apnea have higher risk for high blood pressure, heart attack, and stroke. And when they get identified and use their CPAP or other treatments to reduce the sleep apnea, actually their risk goes down. And so we're seeing this connection between other problems and heart problems. And by working together to take care of these patients with other specialists, we can take best care of the patient.